thanking the organizers for this interesting meeting in such a beautiful place, very conducive to work. So most of the audience are mathematicians, I'm a physicist. I want to talk today about some applications of ideas from resurgence to physics, specifically to quantum field theory, but in the interests of actually trying to communicate with the mathematicians in the audience, I boil it down to a discussion of certain differential equations, spectral problems. So it's really mainly about quantum mechanics problems, but the motivation is certainly from quantum field theory. So I have to explain all these phrases in the title as I go along. So the idea is really coming from the beautiful work in resurgence that many people in the audience have pioneered and worked on, one of the things that's really resonated recently with physicists is one aspect of resurgence that says that, in fact, if you have some system where there are all sorts of critical points or special points, and there are fluctuations around those special points, there's the possibility that there are actually very precise relations between the fluctuations around the various special points. So that's one feature of resurgence, and it's one that's potentially very powerful in quantum field theory and string theory applications. So that's what I want to talk about. When I talk about these perturbative, non-perturbative relations, what I mean is if you think of one of these special points as being the sort of trivial vacuum saddle point of the problem, so that's like perturbation theory, with the fluctuations around that point, Another point may be a non-trivial saddle point, and the fluctuations around that non-trivial saddle point would be called non-perturbative physics. And very often these are thought of as being distinct objects calculated using different techniques. And one of the dramatic implications of resurgence is that there are actually very precise relations between these. Okay, so that's the basic plot. I could really stop now. And, but let me proceed and give some examples. So there's this phrase here, non-perturbative completion. There are specific applications in string theory where we actually only know perturbative information about the theory. We don't know in advance non-perturbative information. So one of the ideas is can you complete the theory, build the full theory only from perturbative information? This is a very difficult and profound question, and it seems that using ideas from resurgence, you can make some progress in this direction. So that's one of the main motivations. And so a symbolic formula, not a real formula yet, but a symbolic formula is, imagine you have some system described by a functional integral. So this is not, this is an infinite dimensional integral. And there's a small parameter h bar in there, so you'd be tempted in the h bar to zero limit to do some sort of saddle point expansion of this infinite dimensional integral. And formally, this should be some sort of sum over the saddle points, the critical points of this thing in the exponent, and fluctuations around those critical points, and possibly what we call quasi-zero modes, the interactions between the fluctuations around, around those points. So that's what's symbolically represented here. Is it real or imaginary exponential? So the important thing is that you want it to be both. Okay. You want it to be analytically continuable in h bar. Okay. Okay, so, and this is a very significant problem in physics because, of course, the real, real in the sense of genuine, object has an eye here. Yes. Okay? But in terms of actual computation, making connection to rigorous mathematics, often it's treated in the so-called Euclidean form where there's a minus sign, and one of the big open questions in theoretical physics is how to connect those two. So 
So one of the forms of resurgence, which I would call sort of the generic form of resurgence, you can already see not in this infinite dimensional integral, but in an ordinary exponential integral. So imagine just a complex one-dimensional integral of some exponential function. And imagine that this function has a number of different critical points. And I'll label the critical points by n. So we all know that to make sense of an integral like that, we deform the contour through that critical point along a steepest descent path. So Cn is the steepest descent contour through the critical point labeled by n. That's now a perfectly well-defined integral. You can expand it so that the leading term is just the value of the function at that point. There's some quadratic fluctuation stuff out the front. And very often, that's where physicists stop. But now let's not stop there. Let's actually take all of the fluctuations beyond the Gaussian approximation. And that will be some series in h, in h bar, okay? some formal perturbative series in h bar. And it's labeled by n because I'm talking about the steepest descent contour through one particular critical point, n. So with, with relatively mild conditions on this function f, you can actually show that when you expand that as a series, a formal series in h bar, the coefficients, whoops, hmm, okay, it's cut off, sorry. This is supposed to be tn sub r, and these are the coefficients of that expansion in h bar. So the, at large order in that expansion, the coefficients grow factorially, that's generic. And there's a power. The power is the difference between the critical point at subtle point n and subtle point m. And there's a minus sign depending on whether you deform the contour in this direction or another direction. And you're basically summing over all the neighboring, and that's an important word that's somewhat ill-defined in the infinite dimensional context, the neighboring subtle points. Okay, so you imagine a, a function that has a number of different saddle points. There's a steepest descent contour through each of them. And you start deforming them and connecting them together. And so this says that the fluctuations around one particular saddle point are related at large order to these coefficients, which are the, the low order coefficients about these neighboring saddle points. Okay, is that clear? Imagine you've got this picture of all these different saddle points. And the coefficients around one saddle point are related by these very precise relations to the coefficients about other neighboring saddle points. But it's that the large order coefficients are related to the low order coefficients. Okay? And this is a very generic form of resurgence. And this has been observed in many examples using not a one dimensional integral, but using a functional integral, an infinite dimensional integral. And the reasons and the circumstances under which that works are at present not completely understood from the, any rigorous mathematical perspective. But I want to talk about an even stronger form of resurgence today, which is there are other situations in which there's an even stronger relation. And this is what I call these perturbative, non-perturbative relations. So there's actually a relation between low orders and low orders around some particular saddle. So I'll, I'll, this equation at the moment will look a little bit cryptic, but uh, imagine you've got the, what I would call the, say the sort of trivial saddle point, and then there's sort of the nearest non-perturbative saddle point. So we know from this that there's a relation between the high orders of the fluctuations around this point and the low orders around this point and vice versa. But there are circumstances in which the low orders around this point are also connected to the low orders around this point. And in those circumstances, it really is true that if you know everything about here, you can actually work out everything about all the other points in just completely explicit form. And that's an example of these perturbative, non-perturbative relations. So we want to understand and talk today about under what circumstances that occurs and why it occurs. 
Okay? So this is, this is really dramatic. This says that if you really knew perturbation theory, you could actually simply write down everything else to all non-perturbative orders. Okay, so this has been seen, observed in the physics literature over many, many years. Um, the first real concrete example was by some chemical physicists studying the uh, Stark effect in real atoms and molecules. And they just observed that there was this relation between to some low orders between the vacuum and the first uh, non-perturbative saddle. The first systematic discussion was by Alvarez and Cazares studying um, oscillator systems and harmonic oscillator systems. And then later with Unsal, we studied the Matthew equation and various variations of that, including supersymmetry. There's been a lot of different examples in different physical contexts, and it's the same structure. One thing I want to point out is that what I'm going to talk about is finding spectra, so energy levels in these quantum systems. So they're a function of some coupling constant, which I'll call h-bar, but they're also a function of n, a level number, the level about which you're perturbing. And so it's actually an example of a two-parameter trans-series, and that leads to a lot of extra rich structure. So let me show you a picture so this is the Matthew spectrum. So this is how it looks as a Schrodinger equation, but of course it's just the usual Matthew equation. There's a potential that's a cosine potential. There's an eigenvalue, which we'll call an energy, and kinetic energy here. And there's a small parameter h-bar. Okay? So as a function of this small parameter h-bar, the energy spectrum in the quantum system has bands, which don't show up very well here, but they're shaded light blue here, and it has gaps in between, which are supposed to be white, in between these bands. In the classical discussion, these are called stability and instability regions. That's the normal jargon in a book on the Matthew equation. I apologize, this should be E. I uh, changed notation in my, in my uh, slides without doing it in the picture, but this is energy as a function of h-bar, okay? Now you notice that n doesn't appear in the equation. n is a monodromy parameter. It labels these bands. So think of this as band number zero, number one, number two, number three, number four, okay? So the spectrum can be labeled not just by h-bar, but also by this integer n. And it labels which unperturbed level you are perturbing. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting structure here. You've probably seen these sorts of pictures in, in, in differential equations books. And this is, of course, a very famous old problem. It's somewhat surprising to be able to say something new about it, but we'll see that there is actually something new we can say about this spectrum. So let me just tell you what the sort of state of the art in the mathematical physics literature is. For general periodic potentials like this, this is an important problem in physics, you have a periodic potential like this. The spectrum is generically one of some bands here separated by gaps. And in the limit where these wells here are deep, there are theorems that the, width, whoops, the widths of these bands are exponentially small, e to the minus some constant over h-bar. And we know how to calculate that constant. It's just some WKB integral. Between, between turning points here. And in the case of high up in the spectrum, you'll notice that the bands are very narrow down here. But up here, the bands are wider, but the gaps are very narrow. Okay? So there's also a formula for the gaps high up in the spectrum. And it has the same structure. In fact, the only difference is that this quantity here, s, s tilde or s, it's just whether you integrate here or here. It's the same integrand. And there's a prefactor, which is a density of states factor. It's the derivative of the energy with respect to the level number. Okay, so these are some very beautiful results proved rigorously in, in mathematics. But there's some limitation. This, this is all to leading order in h-bar. Nothing about the fluctuations. 
and its leading order in this exponential factor. Okay? And we'll see that, in fact, using these ideas of resurgence, we can actually complete this into a full trans series. So here's what the revised formulas look like. Here's the spectrum again. E plus minus means the edges of the bands. Okay, so there's a perturbative series here. So for each n, namely for each band, there's a formal series in H bar, and the coefficients in that series happen to be polynomials in this integer n. But that's a divergent series, it's a formal divergent series. You need to complete it into a trans series. And when you do so, there's an infinite series of exponential factors. And each of the exponential factors is multiplied by a fluctuation term. So we're in a picture like this. This represents the fluctuations around this point. And I've written the first term here. This is the exponential factor. And it has some fluctuations around it. And there's a whole infinite network of these. But I've only written the first one. Okay. So it turns out that in this Matthews system, you can actually express this term here absolutely in closed form in terms of the fluctuations here. So here's the explicit expression. It looks a little bit nasty, but if you're given this perturbative series, this is a, remember, this is a formal series in H bar, you can actually simply input that information take the derivative with respect to n of each of the coefficients. Remember, they're just polynomials in n, so this is very easy. And then you just have to basically re-expand and change some coefficients, exponentiate, and multiply by the full density of states factor. And then this thing is actually absolutely identical to this fluctuation factor. Okay? So what this means in practice, and forget about the details of the formula, what it means in practice is that if you work very hard to calculate, say, 20 orders of perturbation theory, namely this, you can simply take that result, insert it in this formula, and generate 20 orders of perturbation theory around this point, okay? By pressing a button on Mathematica, just expand, okay? So no further work. So this is what I mean by these explicit constructive forms of resurgence. You don't have to look at the large order behavior, you simply insert your perturbative expansion into this formula, and you immediately have the fluctuations around some neighboring non-perturbative saddle. Okay? And it's even better than that, because I can actually write a corresponding expression for every non-perturbative saddle. There's an infinite series of exponential terms, and there's a similar formula at, for all of those, and the only input you need is this formal series. So this is, from the physics point of view, this is sort of the dream situation. You study perturbation theory very carefully. That's often all we can do in certain circumstances. And from that data, we can immediately generate data about the full non-perturbative <coughs> theory. Okay? So the goal is to understand why this is happening and under what circumstances we might be so lucky to imagine this happening in this detail. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we know of now many, many means more than one, but in this case it's about six or seven different examples under which circumstances this happens. So it's getting to the point where we should actually take stock and try and understand why it's happening and how far we can expect it to happen. The other thing is these results are mainly derived in the context of a differential equation using some forms of WKB and asymptotics, but looking ahead to applications in field theory and string theory, we're not so lucky. We don't have a Schrodinger equation. We don't have just a simple differential equation. At best, you have a functional stochastic differential equation, so that's a very different beast from a, just an ordinary, even a, even a nonlinear ordinary differential equation. So it's not clear how to adapt that WKB analysis to that situation. So instead, we'd prefer to understand how it looks in a functional integral, path integral interpretation. And for the combinatorics people here, this analysis actually stumbles across some very interesting combinatorics. I hope I'll be able to convince you of that. And I should also point out there have been a recent series of lectures uh, by Konsevich at IHES on 
this sort of problem relating resurgence and quantization. And at this point, we now have many examples in physics where something really magical is happening, but for which there's a need for real rigorous mathematical analysis to prove why it's happening. That's still lacking. And there are important applications beyond what I'm going to talk about this morning, and Inesh will touch on some of these in her talk this afternoon. OK, so I'm basically going to merge together two things, the top part of which many people in the audience here are familiar with. This is the sort of differential equation, Schrodinger equation type approach, pioneered by many people here in France, and by these Voros multipliers, Stokes diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to merge that with language that may not be very familiar to people here, coming from quantum field theory, supersymmetric quantum field theory, and string theory. And it turns out there's a very nice mesh between these two different approaches, which somehow unifies what's going on. So it's a useful language. So let, let me start explaining where the word geometry enters the context. So let's just talk about classical physics for the moment. So here's energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. I think everybody knows that much physics. So I just rewrite that as p squared as some constant plus a potential. So I'm going to try and interpret this formula as defining an elliptic curve. So this is some constant. This is, think of it, p squared. And if this is some fourth order polynomial or lower, this defines a genus one elliptic curve, right? And I may have to change variables in x or something like that, but that can be boiled down to an elliptic curve. So all of the examples I mentioned before happen to fit into this framework. So once we know that it's genus one, it's defined by a torus, and this means that there are two independent cycles on this torus. And these correspond to having in this, for example, <coughs> a potential like this or a potential like this, there would be, imagine a particle oscillating back and forth in this well. There's some classical action associated with that. And correspondingly, there's a period for this oscillation. And that's a zero as a function of energy. As you change the energy, the period and the action changes. And so this is the, the action and the period. But there's also oscillation here in the inverted potential, which is really tunneling through this barrier in the quantum mechanics context. But classically, it's just oscillation in the inverted potential. So those are these dual actions and periods, OK? So if it's genus 1, the result, I mean, the reason these elliptic functions were invented were exactly for this problem. And these are just the three elliptic functions of the first, second, and third kind. And these periods satisfy always a second order differential equation, and the actions satisfy always a third order differential equation, which is known as the Picard-Fuchs equation. So this is a differential equation with respect to the energy, E. Yes. Uh, and is there always a Legendre relation between these two yes. things? Yes, yes. Um, excuse me. Okay. So Ah, OK. Yeah. So David was asking if there's always a Legendre relation between these actions and periods. And the answer is yes. And I'll give you examples of that as we go on. OK, so that was classical. Now, when we come to quantization, we, there's actually something called all orders WKB, or exact WKB, which is that these actions can be represented as a formal series in h bar, actually h bar squared, it turns out. And don't worry about the details of these integrands. There's a formal series in h bar squared, and the, there's some weird looking integrals in the potential and derivatives of the potential. There's no closed formula for these terms, but there's a simple recursive way of generating these integrands. So both the action, the one in the well here, and the dual action, the one in the barrier here, are formal series in h bar squared. Okay? And interestingly, they're exactly the same integrands. The only thing that's different is that the contour integral around the cycles are different. Okay? Remember, this is a torus. There are two cycles. So 
That's the only difference between the action and the, and the dual action. And every term, the fact that this is genus one, this and this were elliptic functions, it turns out all of the others are expressible in terms of elliptic functions. That's a result of, classical result of Weierstrass and Legendre, et cetera. Okay, so now I can prove to you that for any genus one system, there must be a direct relation whereby all of this information can be derived from all of this information. Or in this language, the all orders actions and periods here can be derived from the all orders actions and periods here. So it's a very short proof, so let me just run through it. So beginning is classical geometry. It's a result of Riemann that once you know this action integral around one of the cycles, you immediately know it around the other cycle. There's a sort of Stokes theorem for the, the parallelogram behind this torus. And so knowing one of them is equivalent to knowing the other. This is classical geometry, so that's good. The next step is actually where some interesting combinatorics enters the game. Remember that I said that what we want to do is relate, say, perturbation theory here to, to fluctuations around here and vice versa. And everyone knows how you normally do perturbation theory. You, you take some particular level of an unperturbed problem and you formally perturb in some parameter and you calculate these sort of uh, series, formal uh, series in the expansion in that small parameter. But there's another way of doing perturbation theory, it turns out, which is that you calculate this formal series for the action here inside the well, and then you apply what amounts to a monodromy condition on the wave function at that level, which amounts to setting that formal series equal to some integer plus a half. The plus a half is some detail of the differential equation, but this is a quantization condition because I just inserted an integer into the problem from a monodromy condition. And what I have on the left-hand side, remember, is a formal series in h bar. And the coefficients of that formal series are some weird elliptic functions in E. OK. OK, so that doesn't look very much like perturbation theory. But if you expand each of those elliptic functions at small values of E, that means you're looking near the bottom of this well. OK, so E is close to the bottom. So that's what we mean by perturbation theory, near there. You now have, on the left-hand side, a formal series in h-bar, the coefficients of which are expanded as series in E. You can now revert that relation, and you can express E as a formal series in h-bar with coefficients that are functions of n. Okay? It's clear that that's possible. Okay. What is maybe not immediately obvious, shouldn't be immediately obvious because it's kind of non-trivial, is that that's completely equivalent to perturbation theory. Ordinary, regular, really Schrodinger perturbation theory. You end up with an expression for the energy, which is a series in the small parameter h-bar, coefficients of which turn out to actually be polynomials in n when you do this reversion. Okay? So this is sort of known to physicists, but I think this deserves a serious combinatorial proof that this, under what circumstances, this relation is, is valid. So I'm happy to talk to people about that later. Next step in the argument. So suppose, remember that these are given by some formal series in h-bar with some coefficients a sub n functions of e. So all of these integrals that you have to do in this formal series, they can all be expressed in terms of elliptic functions. It turns out they can all be expressed as differential operators with respect to E on the, on the first one. So let's see how that works. So this is A0. This one, well, you see, imagine the, the Matthew equation where V is cosine. So V prime is sine. V prime squared is sine squared. It's 1 minus cos squared. You can, re, you can integrate pi parts and shuffle things around and express this as a differential operator acting on this. 
Okay, and it's a result in any book on elliptic functions that you can always do that in these types of integrals. The thing that's surprising is that this is only an operation on the integrands. And so the fact that the dual and the regular action have exactly the same integrands means that it's exactly the same differential operator in the two cases. It's a kind of Picard-Fuchs equation. It is exactly a Picard-Fuchs equation. Okay, so this is, this is important. But now we're almost finished in the argument. Because remember, how does it now go? We know that if we know A0 classically, we know A0 dual immediately, right? classical. So how are we going to build this thing? Well, knowing perturbation theory to some order means we know these guys to some order in N. But if we know them to some order, then we know these differential operators to that order. So if we know those differential operators, we just apply them to A0 dual, which we know because of this. So we immediately know A dual to the same order that we know new A. Okay? So that's the argument. That explains why, where, geometrically, where these relations are coming from. So in practice, what it means is if you find this perturbative information to some order, you can, without any further real work, write down the corresponding expression for the dual actions, just purely algorithmically, no, no actual thinking involved beyond that. Okay? So this is what we would call the fact that perturbation theory, namely this A, encodes also the A-dual information as a formal series in h bar. Okay? So that may sound a little bit abstract because I didn't tell you what those differential operators were and they'll be different in different cases. So a more refined question is to ask, if we go back to the Matthew case, there was this very explicit formula for this sort of non-perturbative series in terms of this perturbative series after the inversion was done. So a more refined question is, under what circumstances is the relation between this and this of this form? Okay. So that's the question I'm going to turn to now. And I, I remind you that if you look at this expression here, there's this formal series, the derivative with respect to n, and we see this thing up here. It sort of looks a little bit like these band and gap width theorems, which are the lowest, low order in h bar expansions. But these perturbative, non perturbative relations coming from resurgence are actually valid to all orders in h bar and all orders in the exponential. So there's a lot more information in these expressions than in these results. Now that's what I meant by sort of learning something new about the spectrum of these differential equations which people basically had never thought of looking for before because there was no reason. So what I want to, I want to probe now a set of potentials, the so sort of potentials with the potential for working for this, based on the Chebyshev polynomials, in fact, the squares of the Chebyshev polynomials. So this is T M, M, one, two, three. So this is T two squared, it's a double well. T three squared is a triple well. T five squared is Four wells, five wells, I can't count, right? And the amazing thing about classically about these potentials is that you look here, this well is a completely different shape from that well, right? In this case, this well is identical to this well, so it's no surprise that this action is the same as this action. But it turns out in all of these cases, even though these wells look different, the period of oscillation and the action are identical in each well. This is, if you ever teach classical mechanics, this is an excellent homework problem to show that this is true. So as a function of energy, these periods and actions are identical in each well up to an overall constant. But as functions of energy, they're the same functions of energy. Okay, so this is why it's an interesting place to start because in this case, we still only have one of these actions for each well and for each barrier. I can also take the index to be half-odd integer, in which case I have these sorts of shapes. So this is the, what I called the cubic oscillator before. It generalizes like this. And this is, say, the double well, which generalizes like this. 
And Matthew is a case, m goes to infinity, where you have an infinite number of wells. Okay, so there's some interesting features of these. I can evaluate the actions. They just turn out to be some hypergeometric functions. There's a, the Chebyshev index enters here in the parameters of the hypergeometric functions. They satisfy a second order equation, just a hypergeometric type equation for any m. And because of this, there's some classical Ronskin relation. Remember that this is just the derivative of this one with respect to energy, so this is just the usual Ronskian for a second order equation like this. If I invert this equation and regard E as a function of A0, then the, this thing becomes this type of relation, which is well known to physicists, called, and we refer to it as the Montone relation. Okay, but this is just simple properties of the hypergeometric equation. What's interesting is that you can evaluate all of these for any M, the classical action and the dual action is very simple. So lurking here, there's actually a modular structure. If I define a modular parameter tau as the ratio of the two periods, and this is a ratio of two hypergeometric functions that are the independent solutions of the hypergeometric equation. So this defines some modular structure through a Schwarzian equation and triangle functions, et cetera, et cetera. And what it means is that normally, remember that the period omega, omega zero, is the derivative of the action with respect to energy. So to go from the period to the action, you have to integrate. Okay, but because of this modular structure, in fact, you can obtain the action from the period by differentiating, which is a lot easier than integrating. And there are these simple expressions for the actions from the period. And the Ronskian relation just gets rewritten like this, and this is a very explicit example of that line zero in the, in the argument by Riemann, that once you know this thing, you can immediately write down this thing. And it's just a, an expression for it. Okay, very, very explicit. So that was classical geometry of the torus, if you like. Now I want to talk about what I mean by this funny phrase, quantum geometry. Remember what we did, we had this A0, which we sort of upgraded to a formal series in H bar. And so I want to interpret this as like a quantum action, not a classical action. So it's a function not just of energy, but also of H bar. And the remarkable thing is a lot of this structure survives. Okay, even when you introduce this deformation parameter, H bar. And this goes by various phrases from the physics literature. And surprisingly, we'll see that there's some interesting number theory enters here. Okay, so there's close relations to something called mirror symmetry and quantum modular forms, which were already mentioned yesterday, it turns out. Okay, so let's just recall, I'm gonna to get to something by Ramanujan, but let me just recall the classical elliptic functions. So here's the period and action, dual period and dual action. They're just expressed in terms of E and K, this elliptic function of first and second kind. The Ronskian relation is exactly what David asked about. It's this classical Legendre identity relating the E's and the K's. Okay, and all of this language is, is very familiar to physicists. It's the basis of a lot of the Seiberg Witten analysis. You can also define now, if you define this modular parameter, there's an interesting factor of two that enters a ratio of these two periods. There's a result of Jacobi that you can invert this. So you can now write explicitly energy as a function of tau zero using these theta functions. Okay, so this is a famous result of Jacobi called the inversion theorem. But given this, I can invert and write E as this explicit function of, of tau zero. You can then take the period and the action, which were functions of E, and now write them as functions of tau zero, right? Because you just wrote, rewrote E as a function of tau zero. And it turns out they can be written also in terms of number theoretic functions, theta functions, and in the action, this Eisenstein series E2 enters. And that's important because this turns out to be a a modular form, and this turns out to be a quasi-modular form because of the appearance of E2 
Okay, so there are these trend modular transformations, S and T, which in the E regime, this one just takes E to 1 minus E. It's basically inverting the energy between the top and bottom of the wells. And this classical result says that you can express now everything in terms of this tau zero. So what does T do? It just shifts. So it doesn't do anything with respect to the energy. It does something to A zero. So Ramanujan noticed that you could generalize this structure of modular functions and elliptic functions, starting not with F21 of half, half, one E, but one over M, where M was two, three, four, or six. Okay. And he realized this relates to the Chebyshev cases that I talked about but with, by the relation that M is two little m over M minus one. Okay, so remember that in those Chebyshev cases, the actions and the periods were also expressed in terms of these F2 ones. And Ramanujan and also Frick did the M equals six case. There's a generalized Legendre relation, which turns out just to be the Ronskin relation of the corresponding picard fuchs equation. More interestingly, the modular structure generalizes. You can define a ratio of the two independent periods with a coefficient that's importantly related to capital M or little m, and the ratio of the two hypergeometric functions. There is a notion of modular transformations in this so-called Hecke group. And you notice that these are the only cases in which this m, that m, and this r are all integers. Okay? Any other choice of capital M or little m or little r, somebody is not an integer amongst those. Okay? But for these four cases, all the of these parameters are integers, and only for those four cases. So there's a nice uh, discussion in, in Bernd's, uh, I don't know what to call it, edited version of uh, Ramanujan's notebooks. He listed these four examples, which are exactly, this is the Matthew equation, this is the triple well, this is the double well, this is the cubic oscillator problem. He's studying the expansion of this, this uh, tau parameter in these cases, and he says, we do not know Ramanujan's intention in giving these examples, but presumably Ramanujan was solving these quantum mechanics problems without telling anybody what he was doing. However, shortly after these people did work out why he was doing this, there's a beautiful result that these, in these four cases, you can actually generalize Jacobi's inversion. And this is you know, moderately recent result by these number theory people that in these four cases, and only in these four cases, where these parameters take these special values, I can again write the energy as explicit number theoretic functions in this modular parameter tau. And likewise, I can express the period in terms of these number theoretic functions in this modular parameter tau. These are the Eisenstein series of weights four and six. Okay, so again, it turns out that the, the periods are modular forms. The actions are quasi-modular forms because they involve uh, E2. This combination is actually modular. So in fact, these four particular signatures and these level R and Chebyshev index correspond to these four quantum mechanical potentials. And here's a picture of them. Here's the Matthew potential. Here's the double well. Here's a triple well and a cubic oscillator. So in these four cases, you can repeat all of this classical modular geometry a la Ramanujan and uh, Riemann. Okay? This is totally classical so far. Okay? These are just the A zeros, just the original integral around the cycles of square root of E minus V. Okay, no quantum mechanics, no H bar, no nothing. Okay, so now let's talk about quantization. Now that we've understood that at the classical level, these four systems are very similar, let's see what happens when we try to quantize them. Okay, so let me just recall again that here, I'll talk about the focus on the Matthew equation just because I have to pick one example. So remember, there's this spectrum, which is a function of the you know, deformation or quantization parameter h-bar, and 
the bands are labeled by some integer n, and there's some relation between these fluctuations and the perturbative sector. So if I translate those expressions into the language I've now been using of these actions and dual actions and et cetera, that expression here looks like this. There are two ways to write it. So now take the energy as a function not just of A0, the classical action, that was that inversion of Jacobian company, but also treat it as a function of H bar. Okay, so this is the whole formal series that I've inverted. So if just those two terms there are the classical result, you now quantize it, you introduce this formal expansion to all orders in H bar, the only change in this expression is that there's one more term, which is a H bar d by dH bar expression. Okay, it's amazing. And that's the content of the previous expression relating the fluctuations around, around this point to the fluctuations around this point, rewritten in terms of these actions. There's another way to write it. Remember the um, Ronskin relation, that A times the derivative of the, the other solution minus A dual, the derivative of the other solution is a constant. So this is this uh, Legendre relation again. And this is deformed when I quantize everything, but in a very minor way. The only addition is that you have this correspondence of h bar d by dh bar of this full formal series. Okay? So this is what I mean by you know, quantum geometry, that without these h bars, those relations are defining the, the geomet classical geometry of this torus in the language of modular transformations on the torus, when you quantize it, all that structure doesn't completely disappear. It gets deformed, but not by much. And for the physicists in the audience, I want to interpret these as renormalization group equations with this sort of running coupling A. And as I scan through, as I change A, I scan from this region here where the bands are very narrow, up to the top of the spectrum where the bands are wide, but the gaps are narrow. And this structure is valid everywhere in this spectrum. And so I describe the spectrum by a trans series here with divergent series. Up here, it's described by a trans series with convergent series. And they smoothly connect as I vary this parameter A. It's quite remarkable. So here, here's the expression for Matthew. Now I go look at not just the Matthew equation, but I look at those arithmetic Chebyshev problems that had the same modular structure at the classical level. And amazingly, exactly the same thing happens. So here's the generalization of the Ronskin relation. I simply add h bar d by dh bar of the action and of the dual action. The only thing that changes between these four cases is there's a constant on the right-hand side changes its value for different values of the parameter m. Okay? But the structure is identical. Okay? So this is quite surprising to me. These are four very, very different problems. The potentials have different shapes, different types of spectra, different physical properties. And yet, the basic structure is the same up to one constant, which I can easily calculate. Okay? So, this was known, this was known, this was known. The triple well was not known before, that it had this resurgent relation or that it was related to the other cases. It's actually kind of, oh, I'll get to that on the next slide. So it turns out these are the only cases where these two number theoretic objects of the modular group and the Hecker group actually coincide. They're the only cases where these Chebyshev polynomials are genuinely genus one, even though remember for any M they satisfied a second order equation, so they, they looked like genus one, but of course they're not. And these four cases are exactly these cases and the only cases under which there's this generalization of, of due to Ramanujan of this modular structure. And I should mention that in some older work and some very recent work, exactly this modular structure has shown up in analysis of some certain superconformal quantum field theories where the parameter enters the gauge group of the quantum field theory. 
So here are the four potentials that, as I said, look very different. These have bands and gaps. These have splittings of discrete levels. These have splittings of discrete levels. And these are metastable states that decay. So four very different types of physics problems. And yet, structurally, they're almost identical. You just change an index in the elliptic function, and you're done. OK? Very strange. Moreover, this one's very interesting, because here, you can sort of believe that every, every well is the same. And here, these two wells are the same. Here, there's only one well. But this well and this well are very different. And yet, what I'm saying is that there's only really one well. And the idea is that the, the period here is related to the period here by a factor of two, classically. Okay? That you can just simple algebra to show that that's the case. What's interesting is that when you now take the all orders h-bar expansion to every order in h-bar, it's still true that there's only a factor of two difference between them. So when you do this inversion, even though perturbation theory looks completely different, a suitably inserted factor of two makes them identical. And if you did perturbation theory that way, the usual way, you would never dream of doing that. But doing it this way, it's sort of obvious. So what about other genus one systems? So, you know, so I described, remember, I described at the beginning that for any genus one system, there's guaranteed to be a relation between this information and this information. Right? Remember this argument that these differential operators on the lowest guys would, would give you the dual action to the same order that you knew the ordinary action. But then there were these four special cases where the expression was even more explicit. Okay? So let's look at some of the other genus one cases that are not a member of this class of, of four. So here I draw some pictures. This is take an elliptic function as the potential. Here you take an asymmetric double well. Or here, this is what's called the Hill equation or the double sine Gordon equation or double Matthew equation, you have cosine of x and cosine of 2x. And here's an asymmetric triple well. There's also a very nice example that uh, Frederick worked on, on the prolate spheroidal equation, where this structure also uh, operates. And you look at this, and here, this problem and this problem, even when this is asymmetric, the period of oscillation here and here are identical, believe it or not. And here, the period of oscillation in this well and in this well are also identical. Not obvious, right? Looking at the picture, it's not obvious. But they're genus one, so there can only be one. And you just calculate them, and you discover that they're identical. The actions differ by a constant, but the periods are identical. So you can follow through all of this uh, discussion. And there is a perturbative and non-perturbative relation, but it's for, of a slightly more general form than the one in those four cases. So let me show you how it works for this so-called Lame potential. You take the potential to be this doubly periodic Weierstrass p function. So it looks, you know, it looks like you know, something like this. And you can change the shape by changing some parameter in the elliptic p function, Weierstrass p function. And that parameter is tau. Don't confuse it with the other tau zero that appeared before. This is just a parameter changing the shape of the potential. And now, in this case, you now have the sort of technical complication that you need to in include the other elliptic function of the third kind, a kind of annoying pi function. OK. With an extra parameter. With an extra parameter, because you have an extra parameter. And now the Ronskian relation, it's not, it's not a Ronskian relation. It looks a little bit like a Ronskian relation, but classically, the derivative of the classical action with respect to the energy multiplied by the derivative of the dual action with respect to this parameter satisfies this relation. Again, that's a property of these elliptic functions. And now, when you quantize this system, you, A0 becomes now a formal series in h-bar, and A0 dual becomes a formal series in h-bar. And you discover, to your amazement, that it's now this, the same expression is true. So all of the sort of mixed terms that you generate in these formal series cancel. 
and it's the same constant. Okay? So this is an expression that directly relates the non-perturbative information to the perturbative information to all orders in H bar. And it has exactly the same form as the relation in the classical description of this genus one system. This example is particularly interesting in physics because it corresponds to a particular special type of supersymmetric quantum field theory known as n equals two star. And the spectral information of this problem is deeply related to the structure of this quantum field theory. Okay, so we can talk about, the obvious thing to ask about is higher genus system. So here I've randomly drawn some multiple well system. Here you can see there's one, two, three barriers, but four wells. There's an overall relation that some overall integral is zero, so there are actually only three independent wells. So this, is, this looks like a genus three system. Now when you try to do all this analysis, the Picard-Fuchs equation is a higher order equation. The actions and periods are no longer elliptic integrals, they're hyperelliptic functions, more messy to deal with. Nevertheless, they're computable in terms of hyperelliptic functions. And by the general, extending the general argument, actually based on the Riemann bilinear relation classically, we conjecture, we have evidence for this conjecture, that there should be also perturbative, non-perturbative relations in these cases, but of a more complicated form because there are more parameters now in these high genus systems. And there's some beautiful old work by Sibuya studying the Stokes properties of these sort of Schrodinger-like equations with higher genus potentials, arguing in very general terms that there should be some of this resurgent type structure. He wasn't using that language, but for these general polynomial potentials of higher and general order. So the sort of ambitious physicist conjecture is the best possible outcome could be that if you look at this problem naively, you would think that to solve this problem completely, you would have to know the all orders H bar expansions about each well and each barrier. Right? Now you've got all the information, and that would be a solution. The conjecture is you don't need the barrier information, that the barrier information is actually contained in the well information. That's what happened in the genus one cases. Okay? And it fits with the general picture. It's just so far nobody's managed to find a completely explicit form of these relations in these higher genus examples. Okay, in terms of these hyperelliptic functions. So I don't know if whether to pose this as a challenge or just to let you know that this is what I'm trying to think about. And uh, I believe that this is, this is most likely true. And this is remarkable because this would also mean that the perturbative information in this system contains all the information necessary for a complete trans-series solution, including all of these tunneling corrections from the rest of the trend series. Okay, so I have one or two minutes. So let me just finish by explaining why physicists think that this is not just a curiosity of differential equations, but actually something that might be useful in quantum field theory and string theory. And the reason for th these couple of slides now is that we don't have a Schrodinger equation in quantum field theory. We don't have a Schrodinger type equation in string theory. So let me go back to this picture again, that the sort of interpretation of what's going on is that this resurgent structure that we learned from the beautiful work on resurgence by many people in this audience, is that you can really think of it as connecting different saddle points in a quantitative way, not just some qualitative way. So there were some technically extremely beautiful calculations done a couple of years ago now where people revisited these perturbative, non-perturbative relations that were found using these sort of uh, resurgence type arguments, but did them the way you would do the problem if you opened a quantum field theory textbook and followed Feynman perturbation theory. So these were heroic calculations. They involved, you can't see them here, but there are 25 three-loop Feynman diagrams. 
It's worse than David thinks even, because the propagators are not free propagators. The propagators are propagators in an instant on background. So this is a really difficult calculation. And it was done both for the double well and the Matthews system. So you have these 25 or so three-loop diagrams. You have to add them all up. Not all of them were computable analytically. Some of them were calculated numerically. You add them all up. You get this numerical number here for the, the ground state fluctuations in the one instant on sector. That was the number of digits they could obtain doing these numerical integrals. So you take this perturbative, non-perturbative relation, you just expand it to two orders, and you see 71 over 72, and this number here agrees with that to that, that number of digits. Okay? Now, I particularly want to mention one thing that will resonate with David, is that individual diagrams here contain zeta values. So there are these irrational terms that show up when you calculate some of these diagrams. You add them all up, they all cancel. The final answer is rational. Okay? And that, the observation of that in some quantum field theory calculations was, was an important piece of the puzzle in putting together this, this um, Hopf algebra interpretation of perturbation theory in quantum field theory. And we see this occurring in this you know, classical differential equation if you follow the standard approach of quantum field theory textbooks. So the moral of this is we don't understand something because clearly this is not the right way to do the problem. Okay? If you have to calculate 25 individual things, add them up and have irrational terms canceling, you're clearly not doing the calculation the most efficient way. Okay? So somewhere behind these relations, there's something special about perturbation theory that we see you know, that it works, but we still don't understand in a very deep way how it's working or why it's working. So what I was discussing it was a, an attempt to try and understand it in a geometric way, but as a pragmatic way to extract the lesson and apply it to quantum field theory, that's not yet understood in a sufficiently um, precise way, in my opinion. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, there are these special forms of resurgent relations that show up. We now understand why they're occurring geometrically. We found an, a new example of the triple well where it's also occurring. It has some interesting relation to some number theoretic structure that appears to be important also in the quantization because it's exactly these ones that have this relation when quantized. And there are interesting, outstanding problems about higher genus and the fact that these are two parameter trans series, not one parameter trans series, and potential applications to quantum field theory. So, thank you. If you have questions, you should use the microphone or you make a very short question and he's recalling it. Okay. Or, or both. Can you describe the constants? Which constants? The ones that characterize the Ramanujan problem. Yes. Are they interesting it, constants? No, the, well, I don't know. Interesting. So in these. Uh, you mean these constants here? Okay, so the, these are the constants that distinguish between these four different potentials. They're just sine of pi over m or something. So, you know, I can describe them. Are they interesting? I don't know. I'll try and make them more interesting tomorrow. Okay, so <laughs> what, what they are, they're, they're the ratios between the different periods in the different wells. Okay, so... Interesting, moderately interesting. Just uh, where do the Stokes constants of the large order, typical large order relations actually hide within this, these relations? Um, they're, they're in those prefactors, so um, they must be buried in that constant, but I didn't translate them. So, but it, it's simple. This, this is a linear problem, so it's not, 
it's not as complicated as I think you're probably thinking of. So it's just the, the prefactor of the fluctuation there that has the Stokes constant. Okay, I see no further questions, so let's thank you again.